This episode is rated M for mature audiences. The views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect those of the PFC Entertainment Network or any of the affiliates that make this show possible. This is the Pure Fury Creations Entertainment Network. Welcome back, everybody, to Shh, We Don't Talk About That. I'm Joanna, and I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Natalie. Yep, and we're here to talk about drama, of course, and uh, our title today is I'm Squeaking for a Reason, and it's all about talking about trauma with your loved ones and how to build that support system that you need. So, Natalie, why don't you take it from there? Why, well, thanks, Joanna. You're so much. Obviously, throughout, like, all of our episodes that we've done, clearly we're talking about trauma. Clearly we're talking about things that generations before us have not talked about, which was one of the things that I did this week on the thought of the day. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I think a big part of the reason why we don't talk about it is because we've been taught don't talk about it. But then there's like the other half of us Gen Xers and definitely obviously the millennials after us and the Gen Zers after us, like they're talking about it more and more and more. So they're normalizing it in a way that we've struggled to normalize it. Um, and they've been building their support system in a way that we haven't been able to build our support systems. So taking a page out of their playbook, so to speak, and like, how do we start having those conversations with our loved ones about trauma? Not necessarily just the trauma that we've been in, but maybe opening the door for them to talk about the trauma that they've been in. Um, and as well as, like, how do we make sure that we have the right people around us that are supporting us in the ways that we need, but that we are also able to show up, them, show up for them in the ways that they need to? And a lot of times we get stuck in relationships and friendships that are very one-sided. Like we've all had that one friend that just sucks the life right out of you, but doesn't give you anything in return. Um, and we've been that friend that gives everything to a friend and gets nothing in return. So it's it's a tip for town, but not like we want to be able to have the people around us that truly love us and truly care about us and truly see us laws and all in order to help us in ways that maybe we've never been able to open the door up for people to help in. But then also, how do we talk about that stuff? How do we talk about that stuff specifically to family members? Like a lot of times it's easy for us to talk about trauma to our friends, especially when we're kids. Like, I know that I shared a lot of things, maybe not a lot, but I know that I shared quite a few things, you know, with you and other friends in our friend group when we were in high school that, like, it took me 5, 10, 15, 30 years to even tell, like, my own family members about. Um, so it's finding what works for you and being able to... I guess lean into the fear and talking about things with family, with friends, about things that make us uncomfortable, that make us scared to talk about. Well, what if I talk about this and they don't like me anymore? Or they start seeing me in a different light. 
Um, or what if I tell my family about something that happened and nobody believes me? Then what? Like, how do I manage those things? And if I do talk to these people and I get these negative reactions, who can I go to in order to help make sure that I don't fall apart? Like, how can I make sure that the people I have around me are supportive and hear what I have to say and know that what has happened to me is not who I am. It's just something that's happened to me and now I need to figure out how to deal with it. If that makes all, if that makes all the sense. If that well, makes sense. I think what you're saying is before you share, it's instead of blurting, you need to think about what, what could possibly happen. Not that it will. And then mm -hmm. have a support system or people in place that can help you move through that if you don't get the reaction or response that you need or that is validating or helpful. It kind of sounds right. like you need to really assess like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this thing, but what's next first? What could possibly right. be next and how would I handle that? You don't have to have yeah. it all, all the details, just like I know I can call A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's like preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best. Right, right, which is such living life trauma. Absolutely, absolutely, because we're always in that place of what's next. Mm -hmm. When's the other shoe going to drop? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when so and so gets home? Or what's going to happen if I pick up the phone? Like we're always in that place of like hyper vigilance, mm -hmm. and we want to stop being in that place of hyper vigilance. Obviously, going through therapy. You've learned, um, like, okay, I was very hyper vigilant for this many years, and now, like, I can be less hyper vigilant about some areas. Some I still am. So, what are those areas? Okay, those are things I need to work on rather than like, expecting like the society to change to meet our needs. Like, we need to change to meet our own needs, correct? Yeah, and. That, that was a struggle for me, um, you know, because I think a lot of trauma victims, I'm not going to say all for it by any means, but there, I feel like there are a lot of us, especially that went through childhood trauma, that either the blame was constantly put on us, and so mm -hmm. it's hard to change that narrative, or you finally get to a place where you feel like you're in control of your life, and when everything starts to go wrong, it can't be something you're doing, because you, you're not hurting yourself, it has to be something other people are doing. Which you then take all the control out of your own hands, put it into somebody else's, and then somehow expect them to know what you need and to to adjust their lives to meet your needs. And that's that right. that ego, you know, that we've had that comes out. A lot of us trauma victims. Um, and by doing that, I mean sometimes you can poison the well. My my therapist likes to use the phrase, um, you need to find other wells to drink from. When I yes. had one or two friends who I would turn to consistently and they just didn't have any responses or didn't even have the, the emotional energy to be able to be there for me. And first I started thinking like, maybe I'm the problem. I, you know, I shouldn't share. And my therapist's like, no, Joanna, it's, you got to find other wells to drink from. Like sometimes yeah. people just get dry. You don't know what's going on in their lives and they may not be replenishing their cup. So they're pouring yeah. into yours and you don't know that they're pouring from like a well that's going dry. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's a great, that's a great analogy. And looking at it from that perspective, because yeah, we are not like, we're not the only person that like life is happening to. Right. Like life is happening to everybody. Um, so finding people to talk to them about things, like a part of it is our responsibility to make sure like, Hey, I would like to talk to you about something that's really big and important to me. Do you have the time? Do you have the emotional capacity? Like, are you in a place where you can hear me or not? And right. if they're like, no, not right now. Like I'm dealing with 27 other things. I'm not at a place right now. Being like, okay, totally fine. Which is a perfectly healthy response, right? But if we hear that 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, 
it's a main problem. It's only because it's me that wants to talk to them. I must be the problem, which is why they don't have the capacity to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Instead of learning, like, they're telling you where their boundary is. Just as much as you're trying to enforce your boundaries with people, like, how can I respect their boundary and be like, totally okay, I get it. Will you let me know when you do? Right. I may find somebody else that I can talk to in the meantime, or I may still want to share that with this person. But being able to kind of find the find your people in order to help you express what you need to express, work through what you need to work through, but then also hold you accountable for like, yeah, this, I, I have nothing. Like I have nothing for all the things that you just said. Have you talked to a therapist? Have you talked to a clergy member? If you go to church, like, have you like, do you attend any kind of support group meetings? Like, are there other people you can talk to? Because like, I have reached maximum capacity and I don't have anything to give to you in this moment and being able to hear that and receive that is healthy taking that on and making it about ourselves is unhealthy so that, finding that balance there's that and I also have found that as especially as we're disclosing but as you're talking to somebody and you're looking turning to them for support even if they say like yes I can be here for you and then right. the what they start to respond back to you with is not helpful. It's uh, sometimes people um, accidentally gaslight you or they uh, <clears throat> will dismiss your, your concerns or your point of view and not give you the validation that you need. That is not the time to convince them that you are right. Right. You can state your, state your case maybe a second time. Like, no, I just had this perspective. If they are still, defensive, maybe they're protective of the person, you're sharing with a mutual friend, something like that. That's not the well. You don't, you're, you don't want to poison it, right? You, it's time to go, okay, I, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your opinion with me. You don't have to contradict them. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You can just say, thank you for sharing your opinion with me. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Yeah. Because they do those things. And then you move on and go see if you can turn to somebody it's not that you're looking for somebody to tell you what you want to hear. It's that you want to find somebody who can listen to you with an open mind and then yeah. give you um, responses that are, you know, altruistic in, the, in their nature. They're, they just want to help. They're not there to service anything on their own. Mm -hmm. It's no, nothing. And you're not, sometimes you trigger things in people when you're sharing. That's something that we all are going to find as you disclose, unless you're with a professional. And even then you might trigger them, but they at least know not to, to show it. Right, right. The general public typically does not. And so you may trigger somebody. I've had that happen before where yeah. somebody was like, I can't listen to this. It's, I can't, it's too much. It's too hard to hear what you went through. And I just had to say, okay, you know, I, I apologize if that, triggered anything in you that wasn't my intention i don't, didn't have to say that part i chose to but you can just say okay thank you for listening thank you for giving me what you were capable of right and then you find the people that are that's how you're going to test is this the right if if what they're telling you back feels authentic and respectful and kind even if it's not what you want to hear sure that's the advice that you want to listen to but if it's if it's coming from a place that they're servicing their own needs more or somebody else's, and you can usually kind of feel which way it's going, whether mm -hmm. you want to admit it is another. Yes. Another issue. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. This comes with some, this comes with some self accountability that people may not be prepared for as they share their story, because even if your story is true, how you share it matters when and where you share it matters and who you share it with matters. Yeah. That's something that, you know, I had to learn the hard way because a lot of us trauma survivors were overshares. We want people to know that we're hurting and we have these yeah. feelings and we need these things from people so that you don't trigger me and I can feel better instead of realizing the trigger is mine. And yes. I have to address that in order for the world to not have power over me. Mm -hmm. But you know, disclosure is one of those things that, like, I actually had to disclose something um, pretty recently that I had been fighting about. I think we talked about it a little bit 
uh, maybe last podcast, but, and it's just been something that has been really bothering me that I've wanted to address, but hadn't wanted to admit was actually a problem yeah. until finally I cleared up so much shit that it was like this shining, you know, glaring neon beacon that was like right here. Rrr, rrr, rrr. So I was like, okay, I feel like I got to address that because it's now keeping me from sleeping. It's so bright. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to my therapist and he gave me advice about how to share and when, and I did. And it was, it was, even though I'm, I've done it many times and it was somebody that I knew was safe. I was still like kind of shaking inside it. I still cried. I still felt shame. I had to sit with that discomfort because I knew I was safe. Yeah. And I did get the validation and the, the caring that I knew I could get from them, but that I needed. And it ended up lifting so much shame and guilt instantly, like instantly. Mm -hmm. To hear somebody else go, somebody that I was worried would see me differently once I shared this, say, yeah. it's okay. You know, I still love you. I, I hear you. And that's actually not as abnormal as you think because of this. And then share something of their own experience that helped kind of tie it in. So when you're disclosing, you're going to feel uncomfortable. Very much so. There's just not a, really a way around it. Um, and you have to prepare yourself for that. And that's where we talked about like being prepared for if you need other people to reach out to after you've disclosed to that person. Maybe you need somebody else to just help calm your nerves. Not to talk about it, but just mm -hmm. like can you help me breathe and talk to change, get my mind off of this. Help me talk about something else. Every single well that you go to drink from doesn't have to quench the same thirst. Right. Yeah, because every single person is going to give you something different. Correct. Which is why so, we don't necessarily put every single egg that we have into one person's basket for our whole life. Mm -hmm. Because then we're just asking for what I like to refer to as self-induced resentment because you're going to keep going back to that person and they're going to keep giving you a response and you're going to build this resentment for them knowing you're going to, what response you're going to get. So it's like, we need to be able to find our people and be like, okay, here's an egg for you because you are super validated. Here's an egg for you because you're going to challenge my fucking thoughts. Here's an egg for you because you're just going to sit and let me cry. Like finding people to give our eggs to helps us, one, take our own accountability for things. But then what do we need in this moment? Do I need someone to challenge me? I'm feeling kind of fragile, feeling super vulnerable. No, I don't necessarily want to talk about it, but I feel like I just need to cry or I just need to rage or I just need to like let the emotions go. I'm going to, I'm going to reach out to this person. That's like the physical friend that's going to give me the hugs or that's just going to sit on the phone with me and let me cry and scream and rage about anything and be like, it's okay. Just take a deep breath. Just take a deep breath. Like being able to do that helps us grow stronger in ourselves, and then finding ways to make ourselves more accountable for what we're feeling and what we're thinking and who we can reach out to. Well, and it's funny you bring that up. I'm sure you know why I, I chuckled there a little bit, because when you said take a deep breath, you know, as you know, um, I just went through like a, a pretty big crisis and yeah. um, it was one of the biggest, mo like my brain broke for a minute when it happened and I could not get myself under control. I had already destroyed a room. I cut my finger, middle one, so I can show everybody um, and bruised my shin. Um, and I didn't do, I will say this, folks, I didn't destroy anything mindlessly. I told you this. Yeah. I was in such a rage. I had so much energy inside me. And I came to a realization pretty quickly that I was going to hurt myself or somebody else it, unintentionally, possibly. If I didn't get that energy out. And so I looked around and I saw something that I could not go. And I, and I thought, if I do that, pieces of that are going to go everywhere. It's going to make a huge mess. It's going to be a problem. But. I can grab that. And I, I grabbed this basket of toys and I just flipped it. And it, it immediately felt so satisfying to hear that crash. 
And right. I wanted more of it. So I grabbed the basket and started smashing it on the ground, screaming. Um, and I couldn't get myself out of that. Yeah. And so I reached out to you. I have other people that I actually talk more frequently with about um, my day-to-day struggles. But when mm-hmm. I'm in so- that kind of crisis, I knew the person that I needed was the one who was going to be able to get right, drill right through that to, no, we're not going to talk about anything. We're not going to ask any questions. We're going to get you calm. And that was you. I felt the safest and the most, um, like the most secure was sharing with you what was going on right then. And it was either that or I was going to call 988. Right. So I called you and I think, I think I left you a message. I think I left you a a voice, uh, like a voice message. I ba- barely remember what happened, but you called me back and spent a f- good few minutes getting me to where I could breathe mm-hmm. and speak. Um, and I, oh, I was grateful for that. And then I, and once we did that, we didn't hash through everything. I, I got calm and I was like, okay, I think I know, you know, what I need to do now. Thank you for being there for me. Yeah. And then I let you go. I took some time for myself and because of the incident, somebody else had already been brought into the loop. I didn't do it, but somebody else brought the person I was in conflict with, brought somebody else into the loop. And so I reached out to them. They're a good friend of mine and was like, yeah, this is, this is what's going on. And we were able to talk through, I went, I went over to their house and we sat down. She had kittens. I got to snuggle and we sat down and um, I had some little kitten therapy and I was able to write out questions that I wanted to ask and th- how, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to process or proceed yeah. forward from there in a calm way without anything stimulating me negatively. And if I cried, they just, let me, you know, my other friend came over too. So it was the three of us and I just cried. And then it mm-hmm. passed very quickly because I was able to just cry and get the emotion out. Yeah. And then talk more about what either I needed or what I thought I needed. They helped me process a lot of thoughts and make things more cohesive so that I didn't come home rambling. Yeah. You know, and it, all of those things together made it so much more helpful. And then as I was on my way back, it's, it was interesting. A friend of mine who's also, um, I believe she just got her master's in psychology, but she reached out to me with her own crisis and it was so similar to what I was going through that she and I ended up talking because I was like, I got to tell you, I'm kind of going through the same thing and this is what I did. And right. then she said something that she, and she was like, yeah, I tried this. And I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. I'm going to try that. Yeah. And we shared, you know, so like coping techniques in a way that was safe and comfortable. Neither one of us felt judged. We were able to get really vulnerable yeah. And afterwards, I felt so much more comfortable with it. Like, I still have my moments where I get down or I cry or I, I rage or whatever as I'm working through this. But it helped release so much of that and me process yeah. so much of it that at least I have a good idea of what it is I want and need. It's just finding the ways to accomplish that now and, mm-hmm. and waiting for things to happen because, unfortunately, in the world of mental health, very rarely is anything instantaneous unless they're giving you like a B-52. Sure. Like you're, uh, it's, it's kind of a waiting process for things to unfold and develop as they're intended. Sure. And when you're dealing with another person, you're also waiting on them to do their part. Sure. So that's something that, you know, if I hadn't built that support system and I'd have had the same crisis, I would have had to immediately go to calling the paramedics calling um, 988 because I didn't have a support system that could have helped me through that. Right. They would have panicked on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, not a lot of people can hear somebody in the state that I was in and not freak out and be like, you need to call, you know, you need to call the police. You need to call the paramedics. You need to call somebody. (laughs) Hang up and call 988. Um, so I was grateful that I built, but I built that support system and I cultivated it. I want people to understand the people that are in my inner circle did not just ha- ha- get there by happenstance. Right. I, right. As we discussed, I looked through that people that I already had a connection with and some people I met along the way and developed a bond. And then I was, I made sure that I started out as I meant to go on. I shared when I wanted to and was vulnerable when I wanted to. And if I didn't receive back from that person, 
the same type of honesty or respect or whatever it was that at least formed the basis for me to be able to share, then I knew that I had to take them out of the inner circle and we had to move them to an outer circle. And that really helped me narrow down because I thought before, like I had like 30 people in my inner circle. No, I don't. I have probably four that are really in my like inner sanctum. Right. And then the rest are actually on like a, a tier just below, you know, where that you still love them. You still share, but you don't share those deep hard things. You don't right. turn to them. Right. Crisis. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and that's people like my children. I adore my children, but they're not the people that I turn to in crisis. Correct. You know, even as adults, unless they can somehow help me with it. Like if I got a flat, when I got a flat, you know, I would have reached out to my son. I, I had my husband, but, but something like this, your kids are not the ones. Yeah. They're not, I know they're your friends, but it's, Unless you have a, an end to your story, a, a way to have that you process it and work through, I feel like sharing when you're in that type of crisis leaves your kids so scared and confused, even as adults. Like, is my mom okay? Is my, you know, is my dad okay? Like, what do sure. I do? I've never experienced this, or I don't, or I'm feeling these things myself, and they're they're they don't know what to do, and they're they're the per, they're the adult. Yeah, you know. So it's. I think that people um, just should be very aware of when you're choosing who your support system is, that they are people that can support you and that should be in that circle. Yeah. Right. So don't be sharing everything with your, with your grocer or, you know, your hairdresser. I mean, unless they're, unless they're a great friend of yours. Sure. Sure. You know, but maybe not at the checkout, like maybe not at the post office. And I've heard people share like, really personal stuff when you're waiting in line places and you're just, or I used to be a cashier. So, I mean, the things that I've heard there because people don't build support systems, they don't know how. And they're just kind of saying whatever they need to say with anybody that they come in contact with, because like, I need to get it out. Mm -hmm. I can't carry it anymore. So I'm just going to say whatever it is that I need to say to the grocer, to the post office person to the FedEx truck driver, like, right. because you haven't been able to find those people in which you can communicate. Yes. And it's like, it's not easy. Like for no. some people that like never like grow up and never leave like the area that they're raised in, like they're born and raised in that same town. They've had all the same friends forever. And some have like come and go. But like they have been able to cultivate something different than someone that's like left home at a certain age and like moved all around. Like mm-hmm. it can be really difficult to find your people at any given stage of your life. And not everybody that's your people in your 20s are the same people in your 30s, in your 50s, in your 60s. Like because you're you're figuring it out just as much as they're figuring it out. And some people are like lifelong, right? Like me and my sister, lifelong since we were 11 years old. You and me, lifelong since we were 14 years old. Mm -hmm. Like we have those people, but then like I left at 18 and moved all around and didn't move back home for 30 years. Mm -hmm. It was like I had to find and cultivate different people along the way. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of it was like, no, I'm just going to bury it deep because nobody wants to hear it. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to, people are going to look at me differently if they hear the things that I've been through or I'm going to be treated differently or they're going to walk away or whatever the case is until it's like, you know what, what's the worst thing that can happen? They walk away. Great. I just found out who they really are. But emoting all of our things to everybody in all the place is not healthy for us. And probably not really healthy for everybody that's listening to it. But more importantly for us, like we need to be able to emote and share things that are important for us with people that believe and reciprocate and know that like we are important to them and they're important to us. Right, right. And being able to identify those people. Yeah, Uh, can can sometimes be a struggle, but because especially because I can't stress this enough. 
There are a lot of times that I've found in my healthy support system, these are not the people that are yes people. They are not your sycophants. They're not going to agree with everything. They're not going to tell you everything you're doing is great. They're not going to tell you everything that you're doing is perfect. They're going to tell you the truth. Kindly, yeah. hopefully, respectfully, with love. Those are your people. Those mm-hmm. are our people. The ones who will challenge us and say, well, what if, what if it's this? Or did you think about maybe being from this perspective? You do that for me. Um, I don't have a lot of people that offer me that. And I personally really appreciate it. It's not that it never stings. It's not that it's never like, oh, gosh. Right. Right, you know, but (laughs) it fully allows me to be able to step back and go, well, wait a minute. This is somebody that loves and respects me. Right. She wouldn't tell me this if there wasn't something there. So instead of discounting it, especially considering your profession, but instead of discounting it, maybe I should listen to this person that I love and respect too and get their opinion, get their feedback on it. It doesn't mean I have to take it in and absorb it. It means you listen to it and it may adjust your point of view. Maybe it won't. But if you are with people that what they're telling you, you're refusing to listen either. That's not a support system. It's an argument. Right. Right. (laughs) You know, so I just, you have to know who you are. I I made this analogy earlier. Like I, I'm not a good, I'm not a good at sharing. I have a hard time sharing my own bagel. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to be one who's going to be sharing um, a lot of things in my life that other people may freely give, may freely just say, well, yeah, that's fine for me. I I don't mind it. Like, for instance, my car. Letting other people drive my car stresses me out. Doesn't have anything to do with them. It has to do with me. I am worried Mm -hmm. about all the things that will happen while my car is out and then I'm going to have to pay for it. Because I've experienced so many things in my right. past. My teenage self is able to make up a story and an assumption. You have to know who you are and be able to accept that to build your support system. And be able yes. to get the feedback that you need from them. So that you can work through your crises and you're not feeling like you're doing it alone. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not to say that it's not good to have yes men. Like, sure. Those friends serve a purpose too, especially mm-hmm. when we're like, like I don't think I'm crazy on this. Like I really believe that this is what's going on, but like let me check. So, and sometimes the people that are going to challenge the thoughts are going to be like, you know, that's whatever you're saying is exactly true, or you're going to go to your yes men for that because you're like, okay, I know that they're going to agree with me. And maybe because they're going to agree with me, I'm going to try to look at it differently. So like each person plays a role big time. Yeah. Or even, I really know in my heart, this is true. I'm just having a hard time trusting myself. So I'm going to go to somebody who I know is going to agree with me on this, not because they're necessarily a yes person, but we share the same values. We share the same thoughts and concerns. And so I know that going to and sharing this with them is safe. And I, I truly recognize a lot of us, once you've gone through some therapy, like you start to recognize when you're part of the problem and when you're part of the solution, it's when you're ready to acknowledge it. It makes Mm -hmm. the biggest, just, you know, that's the biggest thing as far as like how you change and grow when you start doing that shadow work and all that. But Mm -hmm. um, having that support system, be able, like, you're right that it's, it's important to have every aspect of it kind of covered in some way and some people can fill more than one role like you said like you can have people who will i'll be a yes man for you when you need it but i'm also going to challenge you when you don't Mm -hmm. you know so um i think that that's especially people have uh issues with like body shaming body dysmorphia eating disorders sexual trauma sexual past um Mm -hmm. history of you know any kind of childhood experiences like that uh or even childhood abuse anything like that you you need to have that person who's able to keep you grounded when you need to stay grounded without challenging every like it, it everything doesn't right. have to be challenged at, at the same time you know sometimes you just need to breathe. yes sometimes you just need to breathe yeah so uh today i shared uh, a meme that showed a raccoon but it was like um 
if you're mad at every if you're mad at the world eat if you think that the world or if, if you hate the world eat if you think that the world hates you shower and if you hate yourself or no if you think the world hates you sleep that's what it is and if you uh hate yourself uh shower so and i thought that that was really helpful because it brings in all of the like get maybe you need some, maybe you're stressed out you need some rest when you can't see the perspectives clearly sure Absolutely. maybe you're hangry. you know maybe you're hangry maybe that's what's going on maybe you need to just get your get some somatic um responses going you know get some somatic release by getting in the shower changing your body temperature mm -hmm. um so i i liked that when i when i shared it because i thought about like that's something that is <clears throat> that i would share as, as somebody who was trying to be a support system for somebody because when you're building that support so system you're also remembering it's a two-way street yeah right it's not a conveyor belt that they just feed you support and you just sit there and eat it right right like you're going to give back to them too and hopefully it's going to be reciprocal it's going to be equitable mm -hmm. um, so that everybody ha has what they need from the relationship yeah and there are some people because like obviously a lot of my clients and one of the first questions it's even in my intake is like who's your support system do you have anybody that you can talk to about things in your life and some people are like no nobody and so then I'll ask them and be like, okay, so for this question, you said nobody. Like, there's literally nobody in your life you can talk to about anything. But if your car breaks down, there's someone you can talk to about your car breaking down. So then slowly they'll be like, well, yeah, I can do this or I can do this. And sometimes it's like, no, I take it to the mechanic. No, I go to like my pastor for this. No, I go to my therapist for this. And they really don't have people in their world that they feel that they can one be able to show up for and connect and have a reciprocal relationship but also two a lot of times feeling like they don't deserve to have mm -hmm. those people so yes. then it's like okay until we're until we can build your support system like that's my job that's my job as your therapist you need to reach out to me for whatever reason reach out you have a question literally about anything, reach out. Like, if I need to be that person for you until you're able to start building your own, that's what I'm here for. Like, that's what you're wanting in order for me to get you to that place. Or now you're not reaching out to me for like random, small, or even big, huge things. And then you're like, well, I met this, this friend at church or through um, a support group. Because I started going to a support group for whatever reason. Or I decided to join a gym. And like I did this. Um, I'm doing an art class. Whatever it is. Like getting outside of yourself. Outside of your comfort zone. Meeting new people. And then kind of. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, seeing if. One, that they're a good fit for you and what you need, but also can you be a good fit for them and what they need? Because like you said, it's not a conveyor belt. Like I'm not just out looking for people that I can take, 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 take from. Because then it's like, that's not fair to the other people. No. Nor is it fair if I'm a friend, that friend for somebody else and they just take, take, take from me. Like that's exhausting. So mm -hmm. can I show up for all of these different people in these various ways? And sometimes the answer is, yeah, I can. Well, 30 of them I can do it for. Sometimes it's like, no, I have like two. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't even know if it's just one. Like it's somebody else that you know if you call them, they're going to pick up the phone. Or they're going to call you back. Or they're going to be like, just breathe. Just mm -hmm. take a deep breath. Just breathe. Focus on your, whatever it is, finding your people is not easy. No. But it's also not rocket science. It's it's not. I will say, like, when we talk about it, it is great. Whatever amount you find to start with is great. Anybody that we can connect yes. with is great. But don't, again, settle for one. You cannot drink from just one well unless that person is truly in a place where they're 
maybe they're a therapist, maybe they're able to give you that space. Maybe they have experience with it themselves and they know they they've gone through the therapy and they can hold the ground for you for a while. Sure. But if you are only able to build a support system with one person. I, I would challenge that there's still some, some barrier there that's keeping you from connecting sure. with people in your life. Because if we look around, I mean, unless you live, you're a hermit and you live at home and you only order things online and you never go anywhere, you, we do interact with people. I don't go a lot of places, but I still interact with people at least on a mm-hmm. weekly basis. Mm-hmm. And some of them have become friends through the years. You know, I, I go to the allergist and they, the, the allergy lady there that gives me my shot. We're now Facebook friends. We chat about our lives a little bit. She's not somebody that I would call in an emergency, but she's still somebody that I can share like some of those lesser traumas and things with. So she's part of my support system. She's Mm -hmm. things she's going to go to with the stuff. I don't have to go to you for, but I still would like to bitch about it a little bit. You know, right. Right. The same thing for me. I'm in there and then I'll listen to her and we kind of give that mutual exchange. So it doesn't have to, like, I have a few, I have two or three people that I turn to for the big stuff. Yeah. And then, and I, and they, and they, by their responses, like one person I'll turn to for certain things, another person I'll turn to for other things. And then, and they get the same back from me, but then for the different things or smaller, that move out to the next, you know, there might be other people that I don't need to bother my, my real support system with something that I can just gripe about with uh, my gym buddy. Right. right. You know, while we're running on the treadmill or whatever. So it's thinking about ways that you can cultivate those support, you know, like little threads of support to build that, weave yourself a, a almost like a, um, what do they call those uh, things they put under the high wire people, you know, like to catch you when you fall. Well, I have no idea what they're. I don't, know, I don't know either, like a parachute almost, but just, you know, you're, you're building something that's going to, that's got lots of different ways for you to fulfill that support, hopefully. Um, and it mm-hmm. doesn't, like we said, it doesn't happen overnight. You cultivate it, you know, you yes. find all these different places. If you talk to your pastor, maybe there's somebody at church you can connect with, you know, mm-hmm. I, there's lots of different volunteering, uh, all kinds of different ways that you can get involved in your own life. And yeah. bring people into it so that you can then build a, a more rich and supportive system underneath you that you can then plug yourself back into. And it becomes like you, it's a community almost. You're, you're helping each other. You're, mm-hmm. you know, one of you, like I might let one person know of my, my group of there's including my husband, there's four of us and this is my like day-to-day ones. So I might let right. one know and then they kind of, okay, hey, this is going on. You know, we're not going to go to karaoke tonight because of this or, you know, Joanna's been having migraines. Could somebody come help with taking out the trash, whatever, you know, or one of my friends, she's been having some issues with some stuff going on. I should call, hey, can you come help with it? Sure. No problem. It's reciprocal. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And so, and you feel good too. You feel like you're taking care of people too, not just needing yeah. things, not just being cared for. Not just mm-hmm. the quote, burden or problem that we will often label ourselves as. You're actually being productive and giving back. Mm-hmm. So, and this, I mean, and giving back is huge. Like a lot of times with pretty much anything, if you're giving back to somebody, you're doing the soup kitchen, you're going to Salvation Army during the holidays, you're volunteering at the, the Humane Society, whatever, like, any way that you are helping other things or other people brings a sense of satisfaction and comfort to us. But right. then oftentimes can be like, okay, well, I keep helping and nobody's helping me. And right. It's like, okay, is nobody really helping you or are you not open to letting other people help you? Correct. Yes. Because a lot of times people want to help too. But yep. if you're closed off or you're like, I don't deserve it or um, it's never going to happen for me and you keep that door locked tight, you're absolutely correct. Nobody's going to be able to get through. Mm-hmm. But if you're like, okay, well, I want to crack the door and I'm just going to leave it like just a sliver of light comes in and see what happens. If it doesn't happen in two days and you slam the door shut, you're doing yourself a disservice. Like keep that sliver open 
right. until you can open it further. Don't open it until you can slam it closed again because you're not helping yourself get what you need. You're helping right. yourself do exactly what you're already doing, which is staying stuck. Yep. How is staying stuck serving you? How is it helping you to stay stuck? Well, it's comfortable in that door. It's comfortable yes. and easy. Um, comfortable in an uncomfortable way, but sure. comfortable to know it. And, you know, when you go to disclose or you go to share, you make yourself so vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, you're open to rejection, but you're also so raw that sometimes when somebody is being supportive or validating, you're not hearing it in the way that they're meaning it. And it will trigger things that will make you feel like, you know, you're not listening to me. If somebody may try to like share their experience and you feel like you're taking it, you know, you're making it about yourself or whatever. Or worse, you share and the person, like you said, they don't believe you. Um, they blame mm -hmm. you. They gaslight you. They call you a liar. Those kinds of things. It, it, no, it doesn't matter who they are in your life. It doesn't matter how close they are to you. If that's the response that you're getting, they are not part of your support system they're not capable doesn't mean that they may love you but they're not in a place where they can hear that and be the person that you need and and receive the message and and be able to give you back whatever it is you need to get through that that doesn't mean that you sharing was bad wrong inappropriate anything like that you picked the wrong person the wrong person and ended up being available and you thought they were going to be the right fit. And then mm -hmm. unfortunately found out sometimes that they not, you don't know what's going on with them. They, maybe they had something happen to them that was exactly the same and you're triggering all kinds of stuff in them that they can't admit. And so they got to push it away mm -hmm. or try and, you know, no, it's not that bad. Don't, Cause we'll often try and coax people out of their discomfort to make ourselves feel more comfortable. They're making us uncomfortable by their discomfort. So we will try and almost kind of invalidate what they're feeling. But, you know, like it's a, it, there's no need to cry. Everything's going to be okay. You just got to take some deep breaths, you know, instead of being like, this is really hard. You need to feel this right now. I can be here with you while you do that. Right. Right. So it's just, it's just the difference of being able to, being prepared, like, you, like we've talked about, for the possible outcome. Hopefully mm -hmm. you've assessed first that person so that you you have a pretty good like think about sometimes maybe you shared or they've shared other things that maybe and how did they react how did that make you feel does it feel like something that can be built on you know or are they somebody who maybe isn't going to be the best fit for that and do you need to look elsewhere just because they're who you used you're used to sharing with or who you want to share with the most doesn't mean it's right right absolutely so Absolutely. we got to figure that stuff out. And then once you do, building your support system becomes easier. It becomes more simple. I wouldn't say it's easier. It becomes more simple. It's less complicated than people believe it to be. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And you're able to be, you're able to show up for them in a way that maybe you weren't before. Or you're able to show up for them in the ways that they need now. You're able to start to recognize what they need in their moments just as much as they've been able to see what you need in your moments. And so that's, I think, where kind of the easy part comes in. Because obviously it's not simple, but the easiness is like, okay, I know exactly what Joanna needs in this moment. So, and I can give this. So I'm going to give this. Or I know exactly what I need in this moment, so I know that this person can get this. Like, mm -hmm. again, being able to find out which friends do what for you or which family members do what for you in order for you to work through, talk about, cry about, or just laugh about. Mm -hmm. we got to yeah. find our people. Yeah, absolutely. Find your people. And when, you know, when you found them, like, give them the grace to show up for you. Get, uh, you know, you, you want these people, give them the grace and the space to show up for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Allow it. Take the help, even if it feels uncomfortable. Yeah. 
We are not going to die. We are not going to fall apart. Our lives are not going to be destroyed if somebody comes in and takes a little bit of weight. We are not weak. We are not any of the, the adjectives or narratives that we tell ourselves to talk us out of getting help. All human beings, we're, we're tribal species. We're meant mm -hmm. to live in the tribe. That's part of why when you're rejected in some way, like it causes panic in a lot of people because it's like, oh, I could get kicked out of the tribe and then I'm not going to be able to survive. That primitive brain still has that programming in there of like, you must yeah. be part of the tribe in order to survive. So we are a tribal species. You need people that you can share with that will be, it's always kindness, respect, hopefully some caring or love can be in there. But mm -hmm. that's what you, that's the basis that you got to be looking for that you're getting from somebody and giving, you know, if you're always snapping at somebody, you can't expect them to be the best support system for you. Maybe they will be, but right. it's kind of, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's all about how you ask and who you approach and you're, we are the best ones to know that for ourselves, folks. We are the only ones who know really everything about ourselves. Right. Any question that anybody asks us about ourselves, we're the only ones who really have all the, the correct answer. We may not like the answers. We may not. We're the only ones that know. And we may lie about it and, and say something different than the answer. Yeah. But it doesn't change that we know ourselves best. We talk to ourselves the most. And we are the ones who are best able to know when somebody makes us feel supported mm -hmm. and safe. For sure. Right. If you feel that, then that's your, that's part of your tribe. If that person makes yeah. you feel that way, you should hang on to them. If they don't, and it's somebody that you love that's in your tribe, like, like we've said, you know, it's okay to keep them as part of your support system, but maybe you're not sharing everything with them or certain things with them. You're finding what are they good at? supporting me in because i want them in my life what are they good at and what am i good at supporting them in what does that relationship yeah. look like yeah and then you come out of it and i i tell you before i went to any kind of trauma therapy i probably had about 30 or 40 cl close friends mm -hmm. um, and it was people that knew all the facets of my life basically in, in one shape or another very rarely did i feel fulfilled or supported very rarely did I feel like I got what I needed, even though I was constantly trying to meet the needs of all these other people too. And I was becoming codependent by doing so because if they weren't okay, then I wasn't okay. And I wasn't being a good friend and then they couldn't be a good friend to me. And then that caused pain, you know, and it started that cycle. You just mm -hmm. kept breaking out of. It took going through trauma therapy, being honest with myself about what I needed, what I was capable of giving and yeah. what I'm capable of receiving. Mm -hmm. That was what started me to go, okay, I have the wrong, it's not that they're wrong in my life. I have them in the wrong roles. Yeah. You got it. It's like playing chess and you got to move the pieces around the board. Like, the, you know, the bishop isn't going to move like the knight does. And so you have to play them the way that they are meant to be used in the game. And I hate to boil it down to that analogy because we're not trying to use people, but we are trying okay. to make sure that we're moving the pieces of our lives in ways that help us hopefully win, get to the, get to the end of it, feeling like we fulfilled our lives. And by winning, that's what I mean. We have had a fulfilling life where we feel like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a bunch of regrets and I'm happy with the way that I live that life. That's what we yeah. I think our goal is at the end. Mm -hmm. So building that support system will help you get there, but you've got to be able to acknowledge who you are, what you need, what they're capable of, and what you're capable of giving them. Absolutely. Right? So. Sometimes you'll find <clears throat> some of your biggest supports in places that you never thought you would. Yes, absolutely. That's absolutely true. And that's why it's okay to share with people that are different. As long as you're like, you know, you don't have to share the biggest thing either first. You can start with something smaller. Right. And see how they respond to that. Mm -hmm. And then go on to sharing bigger stuff. You know, it, we don't dive right in and, and share our deepest, darkest secrets right away. Uh, hopefully. Right. You know, um, but screaming your needs out into the ether to, for everybody. 
because that's kind of what we're doing as, as therapy or as trauma patients when we are not processing our, our needs correctly, and but we're yeah. going out and we're just spewing it all, word vomit, giving it to everybody. And then a lot of times we're taking, they're giving us strangers and they're giving us advice and we're taking that like, oh my God, that's what I have to do. Because we don't have right. regulation at that point to be able to go like, wait a minute, do I agree with that or do I not? You know, I mean, I, for a long time, even like clothing stuff, I would, I would go and get somebody else's opinion before I trusted my own. And then I had to realize like my support system actually started saying, doesn't matter what I think. What do you think? And that was when I was like, those are the ones that I need in this role. Yeah. Right. It wasn't the, it wasn't the yes men I need. I mean, sometimes I need it when I've already decided like, yeah, I look great. And I'll go to somebody and be like my son look how cute I look. And he'll be like, you are so cute, mom. You know, I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, and that's great to have that. And it just helps bolster that. But when I do that with my son, my son isn't the one who is deciding for me that that's how I feel. I've decided that, but he's yeah. supportive through it. You know, he's not the one, he's not the one I'm going to turn to in a crisis. So I have other people, mm -hmm. well, a deep, a personal crisis. I have other people he doesn't need that weight on him. Like you, like, you just got to figure it out. And once you do the peace that comes with it, of yeah. knowing I mean, it's not that I don't have crises. I do, obviously. I just had a, a horrible one, probably one of the worst in my life. And I worked through that faster and more, less painfully. It wasn't easier, but less painfully than I have with uh, almost anything else that I've experienced in the last years several decades at the very least right and it had to do with who i chose to reach out with reach out to what i knew i would receive from them and being able to receive the information yeah you know using that information to get myself regulated all of those things have left me with it doesn't it makes me less scared of the future which is trauma patients we often are afraid of what's coming because we've experienced yeah. so much in the past absolutely you know where shit's coming of course it is life is highs and lows i know more things yeah. are going to come in some way. But I also know I have a team that includes me to mm -hmm. support myself. And I don't reach out to everybody. If I, I didn't reach out to you first. I tried to calm myself down. Even when I'm less upset about things, I don't reach out to my support system first. I try and calm myself down first. Try and work through it first and then get validation or guidance or whatever that I need afterwards. But if I can't, then that's when I go, okay, who are my heavy hitters in this man? Who are the yeah. ones that I can really pull out and be like, okay, I need you to help me right now. And they're not going to judge me and they're not going to think less of me because I was vulnerable with them. That's what happened. Yeah. I was vulnerable and real. So, you know, when, when it comes to this topic, like I don't, I could probably, in one, on the one hand, you could talk for hours about it. And on the other hand, we're saying the same things. Yeah. So I hope people can hear that we, you know, we've said this in a few different ways, like how you build the support system and how you share. It's not that there's no fear, but how you can share with more safety and comfort there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, like doing a trust fall almost. Yeah. Which are the most scary. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't know what's coming. Are they going to catch you? Yeah. So, you know, maybe try a trust fall with somebody before you share. If they can't catch you physically, maybe they can't catch you mentally. I don't I, I know. I don't know. There's many people I would. And I trust some people. I'd be like, oh, you're still going to let me drop. I know it's going to happen. I know yep. it's going to happen. Yeah. But it's worth taking the chance because at the end of the day, you're worth taking the chance. Absolutely. And. Let people surprise you. You have no idea how often people will surprise you and show up in ways you never imagined just because they finally know what you need. Yeah. You know? I think it's crazy because, like, I grew up watching my mom and my aunt, like, always at the kitchen table, always with the pots of coffee, always some little nice dessert because who doesn't love desserts? But, like, literally, Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, like solving what like I deemed at that time like all the world's problems. 
right? right? And they probably weren't. They were probably just rehashing all their own stuff because they were super close to sisters, like throughout their whole life. Um, and so I always thought, like, okay, well, that's like that's what real friendship is. Like, I need a friend that can sit down through the pots of coffee and through the treats, but then like rehash all of life stuff. Um, and not to say that I haven't had those people throughout my life, but not, what surprised me the most was that that person, for me, not that my other ones don't count too, but like specifically my aunt, like my mom's sister, like that I can call my aunt and I know she listens to this every week. So you're welcome for the shout out, Aunt Tommy. Um, but that I can call my aunt and talk to her literally about anything. It doesn't matter. I've never felt judged or like there was something wrong with me or that I was doing something wrong. And she, my aunt is a challenger. Or my mom would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like my aunt's like, oh, but have you looked at it this way? Like she's always been that person. And for her to become even more that constant since I moved back home, since taking care of my mom and even losing my mom, like she has become the most, I guess the biggest surprise in my support system. Cause she was always there, but she was always my aunt. Like she's right. older than me. Like we're never going to have anything in common. So to find out that we do, like, and I'm able to share whatever I need to share with her and that she's been able to share so much of the things she's been able to share with me has just helped our bond and our relationship, but also knowing that like we have a support system within each other in a way that I never thought that I would have with my aunt and maybe she never thought she would have with her niece. So it's, it's really cool. Right. And I only just found that like in my late forties. To that extent. So it's like you'll find people along your entire lifespan that you never thought would be there in the way that they can be or that you can show up for in a way that you never thought you could, which is awesome. So keep that door cracked. Yeah. Don't slam it shut. That's right. I, I, I read something once online that said... Um, you have no idea how many people you haven't met yet that are going to love you. 100%. 100%. Right. And everybody so. that has come into your life has come in for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. That's right. So look at that. Take inventory of that. Like who's been in your life for a reason? What was that reason? What mm -hmm. were you the reason for in their life? Like some people are just seasonal. And that's okay too. And then you have your lifetimers. Mm -hmm. But it's when you find even that one person, then the door can open a little bit more. So you can find the second and the third. And maybe that's all you need. Maybe that's all you need. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I, you know, the more intimate your, your small, uh, your inner circle is, um, I think the more safety there is in sharing and the yeah. the less you're going to have to worry about conflicting personalities, conflicting opinions, trying to keep, keep the peace, keep everybody happy. You know, I mean, once you start getting above groups of like six, it starts to get difficult to keep everybody's needs kind of managed and keep everybody on the same page. Not that it's impossible, right. but that's a lot of work for you to do if you're building a support system. Right. So build the support system is the least amount of work for you to maintain, right? Not that you don't have to maintain it, but you shouldn't be exhausting yourself to maintain a support system. Sure. So, sure. you know, and that's hard. It's hard to like, especially if it's somebody that's been there for a season and you're used to them and it's hard to realize like our time is over. It's, yeah. you know, and it, I'm, I love them and I'm so used to them or I'm, I appreciate them or whatever, but it's just not time anymore. And yeah. I, I've experienced that fairly recently. Um, we've talked about it, that I had a, somebody who's a lifelong friend that I just absolutely adore. And it is not a time in their life for me. Um, and I had to just acknowledge that and accept that I can still love them. I'm sure they still love me, 
but it's not our time anymore. And when I went through this crisis, I wanted to reach out to them so badly. Yeah. But I knew it's, it's not our time. Um, you know, and I had a little sadness over that and I'm, I'm sure I will for a while, but I also have a lot of amazing people that I can turn to Mm -hmm. that help refill my cup as much as I can refill theirs. Right. We're filling from, we're pouring from our own wells into each other's cups. Mm-hmm. And that's, the that's the goal. So we each have our own well. You want to keep it filled, but you want to be able to, to give to others too. Yeah. Finding those people that can sit around the coffee table or sit around the kitchen table with coffee. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Bring mm-hmm. the snackies, snackies or treats because they're different. I mean, they really are different. And I appreciate both. Yeah, I know you do. Well, I think that the like ending season one, don't be sad, listeners, don't be sad. We're coming back for season two. But ending season one, after like everything that we have kind of gone through and shared, like it's a lot. Re listen to some of them, formulate like your own questions and your own thoughts. Like, I think getting to this point and being able to really talk about the support systems, but then also trauma and how we kind of share that with people in our lives based on everything that we've talked through up until now, like is the perfect place to kind of say, okay. And now we've kind of wrapped season one, which is kind of crazy that we've done 20 podcasts together. Like it's mind blowing. It doesn't feel like that many. Like it feels like we just started, but like this is number 20. Well, time we're gonna fun. come back fresh and frisky for season two. Yeah, um, I'll and be we have like some things in the works and some things that we want to talk about and share. Um, so don't worry, we're coming back. You can still reach out to us on the Facebook page. Like, literally, if you have any questions about anything, you want us to talk about something, like, tell us. You can even post anonymously. Like, it, you don't have to tell the whole world who you are when you post. You can send us a DM. You can send us an email. Like, all of the information is on the Facebook page um, because we want to be able to open the door ourselves to be able to let you in to be a part of our show in a different way. So, do so. Do so. And we appreciate so much that everybody has taken their time out week after week to listen to us and also if you're ever lucky just see our beautiful faces <laughs> then like it's it's been a big step and i'm like i'm grateful and i'm so appreciative of being able to be on this journey with you um and that like this brainchild of yours has kind of come this far so far well i appreciate you being on the journey with me it's been quite a ride um yes and i'm so grateful for every step along the way it's been it's been a pretty quite a growth uh a learning curve for us but sure i'm so proud of where we've come from those first few episodes stumbling along to yeah here now together um, being able to have these just fluid, real conversations with people and hopefully have, give them some insight and some some tips and some tricks and just make people feel less alone because that's sure what your support and this podcast has done for me. You know, my therapist support, my friend support, my support group, and this podcast, um, I listen to it because w- mm-hmm talking about it and then listening to it are different and i'll hear things oh, yeah. i'll hear you say things and i'm like oh yeah, yeah i didn't catch quite same. Oh, okay you know <laughs> same same it's weird getting used to listening to your own voice because yeah. yeah, I, I don't sound like i hear myself <laughs> so that was a bit of a learning curve and i think my sister sent me a thing that said Learning to listen to your own voice is like the highest compliment you can give yourself. And being able to like listen to your voice and not be like, oh, sound like that. And cringing at the sound of it, but being able to be like, all right, yeah, I said some pretty smart shit there. 
Oh, that was a good joke. That was a good joke. Or, oh, okay. That that didn't come across the way I meant it to come across. But being able to like listen to what it is that you're saying instead of just hearing the voice. Um, so it's been awesome. It's been awesome. Yeah. And I can't I can't wait to see how the next season goes. I'm very Me, excited. I'm excited too. And uh, listeners should be prepared. It'll be uh, a little bit more of a personal journey, I think, in mm -hmm. season two. Because we've talked a lot about modalities and structure and um, things to do to treat your trauma uh, as far as like finding therapists and, and those kinds of things. And season two is going to be a lot about shadow work and what happens when you talk with your family specifically or, you know, not more than just building that support system, but what that support system looks like when it fails and what do you do then? And, you know, so we'll have different. Yeah. We'll have a lot of more personal things. Um, I still won't be telling every detail of my life that's for the book. <laughs> but we will, I'm just kidding, but we, we will definitely be getting into a little bit more of a, I think, a personal aspect on season two. And I hope that for listeners sure. will connect with that. So we'd really love to hear any topics that any listeners would like to hear about or anything that they've appreciated that we've spoken about, but they'd like us to maybe expound upon you know yeah. Yeah. so we're here for you right so let us know let yeah us we know. can talk to each other anytime we're recording this for you right, right. <laughs> <laughs> we're right. here just reach out to us yeah absolutely. And we appreciate you all for listening and for tuning in and we'll be back we will so thank you so much everybody and we'll see you on the flip side in season two